I, I just want to start saying that you know social media is a growing and significant thing in the in, in, in the world today. And you think um, when I think back to when I was young, growing up in the Arab world, uh, 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 we didn't have kind of anything like that. Even telephones were very very difficult. But you could never escape that kind of social condition and people around you. In our village, there was a and I think a, a, probably quite a few villages. Um, we kind of had a system that predated the mobile phone and tweeting and so on, which was basically my grandmother standing on the roof uh, of the village of a house and shouting, where the hell are you, boy? Come here. You know, you know, so, so there's that sense in which um, you, can't, you can't turn around to her and say, sorry, you know, my, my battery's run out, grandma, or anything like that. You know, so, so there's always that sense in which you know, social media isn't, isn't something radically new. It's not, it's not completely new like the invention of the printing machine in terms of you know, the way in which uh, knowledge suddenly becomes available to everyone. It is a, te a technological step in all kinds of ways that I think there are some very positive things about it and that we look at it in a very positive way and there's some very negative things about it and you know I'm going to have my smiley face and my side face and uh, a cynical face as well. Uh, so I'm going to start really by, by talking about the way in which uh, the internet generally and social media has opened up I think the world uh, to us and how, and, 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 and how significant is that. And I want to do it from kind of two, two ways. One as a kind of activist or a revolutionary a revolutionary actor, the other as a journalist, uh, and, and, and describe the person how important these things, these, these breakthroughs, uh, these breakthroughs are. Um, the the uh, 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 social media, what they call Web two, that development of, of the internet, in which uh, suddenly anyone around the world can contribute towards an under, you know a greater understanding or illuminating what's going on in our world. And my first kind of entry into uh, Twitter at the time was during the time of the Green Movement in Iran, where really people were, you know, I have no real interest in these things, uh, people were pointing me towards the Twitter and said you can follow almost minute by minute, day by day, the events as they were taking place in the streets of Tehran and Isfahan and various things. And as a journalist, that was very useful for me because I covered the Middle East and it actually meant that for once I didn't have to try and interpret uh, whether, what the BBC was saying, who I didn't trust, or what the Washington Post was saying, which I didn't trust, or to be honest, the Iranian state control media. You can now get it from the ground, from the people, and you began to see. And I think the first thing that came to me was how quickly you see from the ground up uh, uh, what was taking place. And that, that was very important because uh, it, it, I think it was able to uh, illustrate to me and some of the YouTubes that were coming from that, those early movements that this wasn't simply in North Tehran. That is, it wasn't simply in the middle class areas amongst the English-speaking section of a more educated part of Tehran, but it was also in the factory areas of its part, and so on. And, I said, and it struck me at that point, because I'd always had an argument of you know, a, a long-term long friendship with Hassan al-Hamalawi, who's a kind of you know, techno-god as far as I'm concerned, um, that you know, I, these things were useless, that actually was very useful. And I, I, had to, I had to admit to him that he was right, but only on this instant. Uh, uh, and the rest of the time, of course, I'm right, and that's uh, what's really important. So, so that, that sense in which it is an opening up to the world. And I was in a meeting in Belfast uh, for the counter summit of the, of the G8, and it struck me, I think it was uh, Goretti Horan, um, the comrade there, speaking about the way in which uh, the pro-choice movement, which is uh, uh, developing inside of, uh, inside of Ireland, how social media actually meant that they were reaching people in villages in the kind of deep green back, you know, greenness of Ireland, uh, which they were of, of people, a couple of women here and there, who were picking up who said, oh, you know, actually, I, you know, even though I live in this village, uh, far away in, 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 in deep island, I, 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 you know, um, I, I, I'm for pro-choice. And so this is really great, you know, because you begin to pick up people and you think, yeah, you know, people are less isolated. I mean, I think we have to see that, the positive elements of which, that we begin to see the whole world uh, 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 around us. Now, as, as a journalist, of course, it's, it's also a, a bit of a mixed blessing, but it's uh, I'll start with the positive elements of, of what it is. Uh, journalists were always uh, uh, categorised into two, into two lots. There's the writing journalist and then there's the photojournalist. And the photojournalist can't really lie because the writing journalist you know, are quite happy to sit in a hotel uh, away from the front line and you know, get second-hand stories and then write it up into some kind of analysis. The photojournalists can do that. They always have to kind of run in and get shot at and beaten up and all this kind of stuff. And I always, was always more drawn towards the writing element obviously, <laughs> than, 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 uh, than, than the other thing. But it was in, in a kind of more serious way. It was able, especially with the outbreak of the Arab Spring, to give me, uh, as a journalist, an insight into events on the ground which I wouldn't have been able to get before. 
And the reason why I wasn't able to have got before was because, uh, uh, because you know, I'm, I'm cursed for things I've done in, in my previous life. Even though I waited 30 years trying, waiting for the Arab revolutions, by the time they came, I had a very back, bad back problem and was uh, pretty much crippled, lying on the floor. And I remember, um, you know, on heavy meds and all this kind of stuff, and I remember Judith Orr, who was the editor of Socialist Worker, phoning me up and saying, there's a revolution in Tunisia, would you like to go? And my first, you know, response was, uh, uh, Tunisia, why the hell are you having a revolution in Tunisia? No, nothing ever happens in Tunisia. And my second response was, I would love to go, but I can't. I can't because physically I can't move. And she phoned me again the second time when the revolution broke out in Egypt uh, and, and said, are you any better? Can you go to Egypt? And what I didn't say to her was, no, no, Ju Judas, I'm, you know, I've got Facebook, it's much better. You know, it was actually, it was a poor hundredth to actually being part of, part of the events. And I think really looking back on it, I'm really glad, even though I was in a slightly better physical condition because I had arrived during the Battle of the Camel. And if you can't run when you're being chased by men on camels with sticks and so on, then really you're in big trouble. So in, in, in that sense, me going onto social media during the Arab Spring was very much because I couldn't move. And so it, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was very much, very much a poor choice. But I'll tell you what I was able to do, which was to suddenly then uh, 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 plug into, especially on YouTube, but also on, 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 on Twitter and, and various other things, and Facebook pages, the, the development, uh, specifically around Syria, but also Bahrain and Libya, of the political development. You could track the political development through social media, how people's ideas were changing. Uh, and, and, and for me, I think the Syrian stuff was the most interesting, because you know, I speak the local dialect, uh, the, the local Arabic dialect I can understand. First of all, that what I'm looking at when I was seeing these demonstrations were far, for majority from the accent and so on, that these were peasantry, these were poor people, and so on. That, that, that was the first thing. And the second thing is I could hear the slogans. And I can hear the slogans being chanted without any interpretation. And so I can begin to then pinpoint where people were politically and how these slogans developed. So as every day I sort of, you know, went through all the social media, of the, of, of, especially the Syrian revolution, I was able to track very, very quickly the development of political ideas, and, and so uh, extraordinarily useful. And it was also extraordinarily frustrating, because when I was tracking the events, uh, especially the uprising that happened in Tripoli, the first uprising happened in Tripoli in, 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 in Libya, very quickly it came to me what the limits of, of, of Twitter and everything was. When tweets started coming out, which in 140 characters, can someone please tell us, as urgency, how you stop bleeding from a chest wound because our son is dying. And you begin to see, actually, this is the limits of, of, of what it is, because you can't do that. You need surgeries, you need doctors, and so on. And so from that, in that sense, you also felt the despair coming out of, uh, out of the social media, and so on. And then, and then uh, um, you know, the, these valuable insights also meant that you had some amateur journalists, especially in, in Britain, able to track, for example, with Syria, the introduction of foreign weapons and so on was extraordinarily useful and something we couldn't do before. We have to believe what other people said, but now we can look almost into each individual weapon and say where this came from and, and track it. And there's a very good, uh, a very good, he's now turning professional, a man who uh, tweets on the name of Brown Moses, who was tracking this all the time. Extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily useful uh, thing. So I think it, that to, to start off by saying in this very positive way how much social media is important, how it is also a point of entry for many people into activity and so on. But now I want to talk about the other side of it, if you like, which is also, it is a closed world. There's so much an open world, but it's also very limiting and a very much uh, a, limiting, uh, a, a limiting thing. And I thought, well, you know, the best thing to do is just to have a look at some of the boundaries of which social media is and the internet itself and how we can get, if we're not careful, quite a distorted view of the globe and so on. And I started off, you know, asked the most direct question, what's the internet coverage of Africa? And I was actually quite shocked because for the vast majority of African countries, it's less than 1% of the population. So in places like Angola, and Tanz Tanzania, Somalia, Niger, and so on, only one out of 100 in these countries has access to the internet. So there's, so, and, and I should imagine that 1% that has access to the internet aren't living in a hovel somewhere. They're probably, you know, it's probably a hotel. It's probably, you know, the hotels and so on that have this. So there's vast swathes of Africa, for example, in which we, which are not part of the social media. And so don't exist in that, in, 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 that, in that sense. And then when you look at other countries inside of Africa, Egypt, where there's been, you know, huge social revolutions and so on, really internet access is still 10% 
of the population. There is still this very much this the, 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 this limit, and the and the profile. I mean, you look at these kind of you know they generate these maps of internet pointy things, you know, where the traffic is and uh, and all that kind of stuff. And you see very much is dominated, but uh, by, by and large by what they call the first world, and it, there's this huge divide uh, between the two. Large sections of the world have no, are out of this picture. So when we're going into social media and we, and we look at it, we have to also remember that this is to a certain extent a gated community. And that we have to, if we don't understand it's a gated community, then we don't understand how we break out, that we actually need to break out of this, and that we use it in, in, uh, in, 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 in in that way. There's another thing I think about social media in which you can, uh, I think, fall in love with the idea that there's this kind of, uh, uh, you know, internet activism. I think they call it internet activism, which is that you are an activist already, that you've been, let's say, you know, an activist for a few years, or you're part of the student movement or something, and that you can replace this general activism, inside the community and your college, your workplace and so on, by simply going and saying, I become now a media activist in creating this alternative space for, 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 uh, for, 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 for media. And I think we have to understand that this is a retreat there's a retreat into ourselves. And I think this is also uh, quite dangerous and quite uh, worrying. Because I think it's part of something wider that's taking place in the world. And I remember I was j joking last night with, with my partner, because we used to work in the old print shop in the 80s, the old SWP print shop in the 80s. And one of our colleagues in, in the department lived with a senior comrade called Duncan Hallis. Some people might know him. Uh, uh, he was quite an important figure at that time. And uh, Duncan Hallis had a very, very, very strong rule, which was there is a separation between work and home, and that whatever you did, if we had a question about you know, the work our colleague had done, we wanted to ask him and clarify something, we had to lie to Duncan Hallis about why we were phoning. Because if he found out we were phoning about work, he would go absolutely crazy. That's work, this is home, and we have to keep that separate. And I think that was quite important. And that idea that now that's beginning to melt away, that you sit on a train and you see people on the phone having to do work. You have no free time in that sense. Um, I remember when I started as a socialist worker, we were refusing completely to have a mobile phone. I actually hate mobile phones because, you know, people can find you, you know. <laughs> so, what's the point, you know, you want to be able to I I escape. And it being a condition uh, that they actually physically went out and bought me a phone and made me, uh, made me take it. I didn't actually want, to, I didn't want a telephone. But that sense in which uh, we, that, that every part of our world now is something that's been intruded upon. And I, you know, I have, people might know me, may not, I have, a fascination, I have a huge fascination with cooking, with food and so on. And I recently, you know, you know have, have fallen for what they call the modernist cuisine, which is all, you know, sous vide and, and all this kind of stuff. And I made the mistake of putting in some recipes on the internet, and now I cannot Google anything without a bloody sous vide machine popping up. It's like, this is my only interest now is, uh, is, 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 is cookery, and it's an important interest. And so what you begin to see is that instead of uh, uh, it opening up, the way in which Google's work and the way in which the internet work, uh, are company, are they, are, they are reducing you down to a particular character, a, tip, a particular type in what you type in, what you look for, and then they begin to limit that down as well. And the same goes for if you're looking for stories and so on. I think one of the, one of the things I do, because you know, as a rule, I don't buy a newspaper because you can read it online, but every now and then I'll sneak in and have a look just so I can see the stories I would miss. Because when you open a newspaper, there's a whole series of stuff that you wouldn't see if you're simply looking type in Syria and so on. So that sense in which it is opening, but is also narrowing, and it's very important uh, to, 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 to understand. And inside of this gated community of the internet, there's also circles and within circles and within circles, and that's really important. But there's something, I think, about the atomization that, I find, that I'm finding more and more worrying. Um, which, and it reminded me of an experiment, I think, that was done in the 1960s, 1961, called the Milgram Experiment. I don't know if people might know it, but I'll explain to you what it was. There, some psychologists decided to try and figure out, or try and psychologically map, uh, why uh, an officer in, uh, you know, a Nazi would kill someone. What is it, that authority, that means that people who were perfectly normal before suddenly turn into mass murderers? And they concocted this experiment, which was a fake experiment, and it was one of the things psychologists do when they lie to you about... Uh, about what, where they're drawing you in, which was they said, well, what we're going to do is, we, is we're going to hook up uh, our subject to an electric current, and we'll bring in volunteers, and what we want to do is to test their memory to pain threshold. Actually, what they wanted to do was to test how far they can push people to administer pain on a subject. And they discovered something very interesting. 
the closer that they were to the subject, so they asked them a whole series of questions, they get the questions wrong, the actor basically made sure he got the questions wrong, and the scientists would turn to the subject and go, now turn up the vol voltage. And, and as they turn up the voltage and hit it, the, the actor would go, oh, that really hurts, that really hurts, and so on. And what they discovered was you, the closer you are to people, the more you look at people in the face, the more you hear people's pain and so on, the less you're able or willing to take it beyond what, are you, what is an acceptable limit. And they did this, where they were in a separate room, but they could see them, all the way to being in a completely different building. So they were totally isolated from the subject. And what they discovered was, was that they could force the, 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 the person in the experiment to administer levels of pain that were life-threatening because they couldn't hear or feel or see the pain of the people. And this really struck me about a lot of the kind of nonsense, the dark side people talk about social media. Why is it you can sit in your room and be quite nasty to other people that you see the next day and you're like smiley because really you lose that social interaction. And I think it's quite dangerous because I think we are social creatures and there is more than simply sticking a, you know, a, a, a smiley face to mean this is an ironic or I'm joking or so on uh, to that bit where, where you're all in the pub, whatever, a fight breaks down, there's always someone who goes, now calm down, calm down, will you? Or the other one goes, come on, let's take it outside. But what, in that sense in which things will resolve. So we are being atomized away. And the danger of us being pulling away is that we lose that sense of, you know, uh, uh, being part of something, of that pain is something real, that what you say to something, to, to someone about something. And this is a psychological state, and we can measure it in a psychological state. So there's that sense in which arguments that you have of a whole series of stuff. Because, you know, I've had huge rows with my mum, for example, uh, on, 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 on Facebook. One of the reasons I came off Facebook was because my whole life I've been hiding my politics from my parents and suddenly there it was, you know, you know my uncles were phoning up, saying, what's the matter with your son, you know, why has he joined the Muslims and all this kind of stuff. Uh, 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 so I've got 10 minutes left, cool. So, so there's that element of it, I think it's really important. So opening, but it's also something that closes down on you and you have to be very, very careful. Uh, you have to be very careful about it. Now I want to talk uh, really about this idea that it being a kind of alternative space. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's a nice idea that you have alternative spaces inside of capitalism. In these alternative spaces, how do we get around the domination of the media? Social media is one way of doing it, and so on. And there was a very good joke on Twitter um, by, a, a, I think he's Lebanese, of course. Anyone with a sense of humor must be Lebanese, called Karl R. E. Marx. And he said, people in the West have been complaining so many years that their governments don't listen to them. Now we know, not only are they listening to them, they're also reading their emails, they're looking, you know, <laughs> that actually what the Snowden uh, 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 stuff has shown us is, is that, that our lives are completely open to the state. And not only, it wasn't simply a paranoid thing, is that there they were. Every part of what we do is now open and they're visible. And, and I had a kind of personal experience with this when my brother died tragically a few years ago under quite you know, difficult circumstances. And what used to happen was that the press used to come and they used to doorstep you. They used to come and try and find a picture and so on. They raided my brother's Facebook account. Before I knew it, his pictures were all over the internet. And, and you felt in which that point in which that openness that you give, suddenly there they were stealing your stuff and taking your stuff. And I think that's quite, uh, that's quite important. And, I, and, and so, so looking at element of it, I came across the, the subject of, of, a, of, of a lad who was, I think, 19-year-old lad in Texas called Justin Carter. Uh, Justin Carter has just been released on bail after five months solitary confinement and faces a 10-year imprisonment for uh, typing during uh, you know, one of these shoot 'em up games, uh, something like, uh, I'm going to raid, you know, I'm going to raid your school, uh, beat you up, and I'm going to eat your still beating heart. Something boyish, something lads say to each other all the time, followed by those disclaimers, lol and JK, JK meaning just kidding. This was picked up by Texas State Police, raided him, raided his house, took him under Section 3 of the Felony Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, even though this is the kind of thing boys say to each other really all the time, suddenly what you say you think to your mate is being picked up by the state. This kid really has only been released after five months of confinement for essentially a boyish joke, and now faces 10 years imprisonment. And it gives you a sense in which of this. Two, really, I think the things about the, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the lads up in Scotland and Glasgow, some down in Kent during the riots, who said, come on then, let's have a riot, boys. Boys spelt with a Z. And I think anyone spells boys with a Z should not be up against the courts, should be up against their teachers. You know, you know what I mean? So, so you know that there is the color bravado and so on. Suddenly you find that they can come in very, very quickly. Suddenly. 
what we feel is open, what we feel is acceptable, suddenly becomes something the state can, uh, can, can pu pull in. And just in case anyone wants to say anything, you know, in a semi-ironic way and so on, you will fall foul of section 44 and 46 of the Serious Crime Act. So even if you say something, if you call a Nazi scum, for example, on, 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 on Twitter, and then that next week there is a big fight with the police and anti-fascists, you can be done under this section. So it's really important we understand that as much as this is an opening, this is also an opening for the state in order to, to, to take, and we have to understand that very much. And in the middle of all, this idea about there being alternative spaces and so on was, I think, uh, my favourite ever police force, which is the Greater Manchester Police Force, uh, and, they said, and they said this, this difference between the real world, like the physical world, and the, and the parallel internet world, and, and this is the quote from the Chief of the Police, if you have been using social networking sites to incite disorder, expect, expect us to come knocking on your door soon. So it's this idea that, you know, here in this alternative space, we can say, you know, let's have a riot or let's do this. Actually, in the real world, in the physical world, the police will come smash down your door and take you away. And there's quite a few young people who've got four years in prison, two years in prison, their lives ruined, to be honest with you. For, and you think, are these people, are these, you know, the, the, the centre of these riots? No, they're not. But that they will find ways in which they can, um, in which they can, uh, in which they can, can come down with you. So there is that element of us here in the first world, in the democratic world, to the extent in which I saw then in Syria. The way in which Facebook became, to be honest with you, the worst possible place to go. Uh, because there, what was happening was in the first raids on the, 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 you know, the, the young in activists who were, becoming, who were becoming politically aware inside of Facebook and social media and so on, was there were, the state was coming in, seeing who their list of friends were, and then going in and doing huge sweeps. So actually, um, they're getting messages from the Lebanese comrades to, to the extent of, here is an order, get off Facebook now. You know, the sense in which we have to close everything down. And it reminded me very much on, thank you, it reminded me very, very much on something that I think we have to look at as revolutionary socialists, is that we don't think in terms of parallel spaces or that we can have an alternative because actually we have to smash the state, really. There is, a, you know, my favourite T-shirt that was worn by an anarchist, which I think is a good reminder, which is don't forget to smash the state. You know, that there is that sense in which we are in, in, a, in a physical fight the biggest fight that took place in Tripoli and the first uprising was an attempt by the youth to burn down the TV station. Because even though there is this alternative world, actually the state was using the TV to undermine the revolution, to put out lies, and so on. And I came across some interesting figures and facts about the Arab revolutions, uh, which was the, one of the biggest surveys done uh, quite recently, a 21, 21, let me find, just find the exact figures. Oh, sorry, my, my former... Sub, uh, deputy editor to see if I get anything wrong then he'll pull me up again uh, um, which, which was uh, a survey of 21,350 Arabs in which they discovered that 78% of those people got their news from TV this is post revolution only 6% got their news from Twitter or from Facebook or from social media and only 4% got from print media so the vast even in the age of revolution where so much, is, you know, so much of this modern technology is being used, the vast majority of Arabs involved in the revolutions, 78%, get their news directly from the TV stations. So who are these TV stations? There's the state media, there's Al Jazeera, and so on. And all of these, especially Al Jazeera, has an agenda. They all have an agenda, so it's all part of that, uh, that, that sense in which however much we create an alternative, when we come to that point where we have to uh, where we have to uh, uh, take on the state in a real way, actually, we, we, we have to put it very much in perspective, uh, social media in, in perspective. The vast majority of people inside the Arab world, and I suspect other places, get their news directly from where they got the news from before. And so that actually makes that battle for the media is not simply about making an alternative space, but actually about how you, you know, destroy the TV station, how you actually remove uh, a, a propaganda tool from the state, and so on. I think that's really important. Then I want to finish... I've been given five minutes. I, 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 I'll, I'll try and do this as, uh, as, as close as possible. And the people, uh, uh, Hassam also, also did this when he, when he talked about the internet as an, as an organizer. Uh, uh, put it this way, you know, that we could use this social media. It can be an alternative, if you simply think of it in a technological manner, an alternative to the print media. Now, uh, uh, the thing about the print media uh, uh, is that it is old-fashioned. It is absolutely old-fashioned technology. 
it is, uh, uh, it is something you have to physically do. So to sell a paper, you know, to send a tweet, you send a tweet out. To sell a paper, you have to go physically to talk to people. And Lenin wrote a very interesting little pamphlet called What is to be Done, in which the whole of the pamphlet, he doesn't mention the telephone. They say, oh, how backward is you know, Lenin? Why do you mention the telephone? Or oh, the telegraph. There was a, that was the Twitter of its day. Why don't I mention the telegraph? Because actually, what he saw as building the circulation of a revolutionary newspaper as also building the physical elements of the revolutionary organization, the revolutionary movement. So to put in, to send in newspapers from Switzerland, the Bolshevik newspapers from Switzerland, into Russia, those routes were also the routes in which they took dissidents out. So part of that, building the physical element, the physical the superstructure of a revolutionary party, of a revolutionary organization, meant meeting people physically. There's also that other element in which, you know, if you're, that we understand what is the agency of change inside of the revolution. Is it the street, is it mahalla, or is it, is it tahrir? And I believe very much that it's mahalla. And what is the difference between places like Syria and places like Egypt is in Egypt, the working class were quite central to the uprising. And we can see, and it was very good to be able to see the events taking place in Tahrir, but we were missing what was taking place in Suez and Port Said and so on, in which were taking place the factories coming out and strike and so on. So we took, when you look to who are the agency of change, it's not simply the street, because in Syria we had people more, more brave than they did in Egypt. But actually when you came up against that, that final question, can there be a general strike, there was no, you know, it, it, it was difficult in Syria, whereas in Egypt it was already, de it, it was already de developed. So you have to think of factory to factory. You have to think of how factories organise, how neighbourhoods organise, and to be honest, you can't do this on Twitter. This has to be done physically in, a, in, in, in an absolute uh, f f f physical world. And I was going to finish very much with this, both as a criticism and a praise. This is the Egyptian newspaper, Ishtirakiya. It is a one guinea, which is one Egyptian guinea. Uh, I come out of print media, and I'll tell you that this is probably one of the most poorly printed and produced newspapers I've ever seen. Its technology is probably 1930s. It's, there is all kinds of lateral slur. They've got the wrong shade on the, on the tints. You know, the, you know everything, about, everything about this tells me this is, yeah, this is so old technology. But that's the important thing is what's written on the front there. 30th of June, kick Morsi out. What I want to know, what, what I found out, was thousands, if not tens of thousands, of this newspaper were going into the factories around Suez, around Cairo, and so on. So it isn't what is the most you know, uh, developed technology we can use, what is it we need to use at a particular time. And we use that very much as being not slaves to this technology, but we use it as a tool in the same way as, uh, as, as everything else. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, really impressed by your speech there, and I have to say also very relieved because I had a feeling you might be extremely uh, upbeat about social media. And I want to reinforce one or two of the cautionary points you make. You know, some people might say, "Well, he wouldn't be so uh, they're all very new to him." But I, it's the, the point I the points I want to make are based upon uh, experience in Leeds and. Uh, I'm very active in United Against Fascism in Leeds. Leeds has a long tradition of uh, extreme right-wing and fascist uh, uh, activity that's put in a fairly heavy city to live in. Uh, anyway, we had um, two fairly significant confrontations with the fascists over the last uh, few months, and differences emerged within the UAF. And we had a meeting to talk, to debate and discuss this, which was fairly vigorous. Uh, and I thought, well, yeah, that's fine. We, we, at least we understand the differences which are to do with when and when do you um, attack fascists physically. And what happened after that was that a, a, a significant number of people split away from UAF. Uh, and on Facebook and, and blog sites, there appeared uh, quite a lot of inaccurate uh, accusations about UAF. And so people I thought I worked with quite well, uh, one or two of them I, I now distrust because, as you rightly said, and I, I wrote down, but I haven't got it with me, but to, to, to quote what you were saying, that um, people can very, be very vitriolic on the internet and then um, uh, be very smiley in your face. I think that's a really down, big downside uh, of, of, of the internet. Uh, the other one is that, um, it's a qualifying <coughs> point, really, that that isn't universal. In my work, I, uh, which is very different from anti-fascist work, I, uh, I, I, I follow blogs and I contribute to the blogs. Uh, and although sometimes the debates are very vigorous, they don't descend to the sort of personal abuse 
that you often find in political media. I'm also a member of Leeds SWP, and it won't be any secret, there's been some disputes with SWP, which I find deeply depressing looking at some of the stuff on the internet and the personal abuse that goes on. So it's, it's, it tends to be subject specific, I think, that, that goes on in work, no, no real problem. In politics, it seems to lift the lid off some people who are sitting at a computer. The experiment that was talked about, uh, you're not actually face to face with the person, not face to face with me in this, these particular examples, uh, and can say what you like uh, on the internet. So really, I want to make a plea to people to, to do listen to that message that was made and I'm trying to reinforce, but some courtesy and honesty when you're using the internet in the same way that you would try to do, I hope, in face to face stuff. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I work in Oxford University and um, I've sort of seen different uh, sort of sides of the social media when it comes to organising because I've been very active on Facebook you know, recently and uh, yeah, I've had a lot of arguments on Facebook, I've learned a lot of inspiring things, I've, I've passed on information to people who couldn't know was that political. I've actually, my wife's Portuguese and I managed to you know, find out things about the Portuguese uh, left and what's going on there in ways I think that, that would be difficult without having this kind of uh, access to people via Facebook. Um, but I think there is also a sense that we've got to be careful of, 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 of seeing kind of you know, social media as kind of ends in themselves. Because on the one hand, I think they can, they can be a false kind of solace, I think, because you, you, you're talking to like minded people that actually there's a, there's a kind of bigger movement out there that, that you can just interact with, with, with virtually. Um, and, uh, and not actually have to go out there and actually engage in, 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 in the real world. Um, but also, also that you can also get, I think, a negative sense of, of the possibilities. Um, so another thing that you know, I've, I've probably been more active doing recently is, uh, is selling socialist work in Oxford. And, uh, and one thing there that really struck me is, is how uh, much anger there is there that you can, it's very difficult to sort of sense it when you're just talking to people who are kind of already, you know, lefties already. Anger amongst all the people who, you know, probably if they're using Facebook at all, they're certainly not engaged in political arguments. And actually, the arguments I've had, you know, from, from standing there with a petition, you know, against the bedroom tax and all these things, it, 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 it's, been, it's been fantastic. But it's really made me feel that there's a, there's a huge anger there that, that really, uh, all, all, although things can seem quite passive, uh, actually we, 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 can, we can channel. And I think that's why, you know, then when things like the People's Assembly uh, and things like that happen, which, we, which really has been quite, quite a, a big thing in Oxford, we, we've had our first organising meeting, we had, we had a brilliant turn out for that, we're looking forward to a huge Oxford uh, People's Assembly meeting. It, it's maybe not so much a surprise actually when you're out there on the street actually talking to people. Um, so, so I think, I think it's, it, for me it's, it's a kind of double-edged thing, but, but ultimately, um, you know, talking to people in the real world is, is a good thing. I mean, just to one, one final example, um, I, 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 one of the, I teach at a college in Oxford. Um, I recently sold a paper uh, to, to the head gardener. I, I've never engaged with the head gardener in any kind of political way through any kind of social media, but actually standing there and, and having a petition meant that we had a chat that we wouldn't normally have had, so I just wanted to put the real world up there as, as an important thing to, to be involved in. I just want to say something about the, uh, the media and uh, what's been happening recently in Turkey. Uh, it is very much a double-edged uh, double sword. Some of it's fantastic. Uh, the use of technology, you may have seen, uh, if you've seen the helicopter shots taken from a toy helicopter uh -huh. over the demonstrations, they're absolutely uh, fantastic and uplifting. Or the existence of live TV channels bringing in live, live feeds from all the forums, or, or many of the forums in Istanbul, so you can watch forums in six different parks at the same, at the same time. These are fantastic. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great propaganda tool. Um, I just took two images, one from Istanbul Gay Pride, and one from a march in Diyarbakir, both of which had very long uh, flags in them, and just wrote two rivers, one sea, which is making an important political point about uniting uh, gay pride and the Kurdish struggle. And he got 2,000 cheers. That was kind of uh, you know, an example of what you can do. The problem comes when you look at what else you need to deepen the struggle, because on the other side, as well as going out on, on the streets, I'm involved in unionisation. In the last three years, we've been unionising my workplace. And I've had we have had a continuous struggle against believing that you can do this job with email and Facebook. Of course, we have a union Facebook page, we have a union site, we have a union blog, we have all these things. But the fact is that what we've discovered over that period of, uh, of three years of struggle, we've had two, three months sit-ins, we've had a whole load of things going on, that if you want to succeed, if you want to give people the confidence 
to resist the employer, then you can't do it by sending them emails. You have to go around and talk to them one at a time. And I've had this fight with the union bureaucracy. The union bureaucracy think, oh, we've got an email list. We send out the, the union <coughs> bulletin over email. I said, no, no, no. And sometimes I've had to pay for it myself. We are printing it, and I'm going to go around door to door, <coughs> collect them. Why? Because the management blocked the emails. That's one thing. You know, email is a technology that can be blocked. So work emails are blocked uh, uh, from, from the union. And it doesn't have the impact. People don't necessarily even read the emails. If you walk in through their door and talk to them, you're in a position to give them, uh, give them confidence. And even within the activists of the union, email, of course, is very dangerous because of flames. Because of you know, what you've referred to, that when people are that distant from one, one another, a small dispute among activists about how to deal with a particular problem can blow up. Uh, out of all proportion because you're not face to face and, and judging one another's uh, personal reactions. So although we have to use this new technology in order to see what's going on, it gives us the ability to see, for instance, what's going on in a small town in Turkey and see that there even, they are driving the police out of the streets and the neighbourhoods. That's great. It's great propaganda. It's great to know that it's happening. It's great to be able to follow it. At the same time, when you want to deepen that organisation, you want to give people confidence, you want to deal with arguments that you can't express in three words, you know, two rivers, one seas, fine, that's a, that's a message, but then you need, to, you need to put across something that's more sophisticated about how you deal with the state, then, uh, then you need face-to-face -face communication, you need to have a, and you need to make it concrete. For us in unionising in the workplace, you need a, a piece of paper with an argument and some, some things that aren't people, and then you take it to them, and then you discuss it with them. And that's, and, and that's uh, well, and of course there is the last thing, which is the danger. I made the mistake of posting uh, a photo of the uh, last year, opening rally of last year's Marxism on my Facebook page, and when I got back to Istanbul, I found myself on a disciplinary <laughs> investigation because there was a small problem with my legal application. <laughs> <laughs> The last comment spoke really well. I think it's important that we don't end up trying to counterpose two spheres of political activity. Physical activity and print publications are obviously centrally important to revolutionaries, both because they give us an ability to collate and politically prioritise ideas in a physical form, which we can take to people, but also because it provokes a real world relationship. You can, have, you can identify people in your workplace, you can build collective discussions, and I think that some of the, the way that comments have discussed it is in danger of polarising a discussion with the two forms of organisation as seen to be incompatible. When actually, if you, people should watch the video that Mika Hossam did from Egypt last year at Marston Revolution 2.0 and the article that he wrote following it on being communist correspondent to the digital age. I think some of the lessons from the revolutionary socialists in Egypt are incredibly inspiring about how do you marry together traditional forms of revolutionary organisation selling your publication, producing in very difficult circumstances a revolutionary paper, with forms of activity on Twitter, on the, on the internet, on using their website, not just to, to spread information, but actually to build organisation around it as well. I think the way that people like Hossam and Gigi use their Twitter accounts, not just to agitate around Tahrir Square, to spread the message globally, to get information out in a place that we could never have imagined even a few years ago, but RS and other group, revolutionary groups around the world have actually managed to feed that into, relate it to their traditional forms of activity, to strengthen, spread their message more broadly, but also to get in touch with new forces they can organise. And people talk about the relationship to small towns, the ability to get out there. And I think some of the things that Hassan talked about last year, about how did they apply that to link the lessons of Tahrir Square, to, listen, to link the movement on the streets into the work that the RS have been doing traditionally around the workplaces in Malhalla, in terms of trying to draw those two elements of the struggle together, to create the, the weight of the workers movement behind Tahrir Square, to give political direction to it, and argue for a strategy through the movement. I think one of the, the things around social media is about how do we engage with the movements as they exist in, in, the, in the current period. If you look at, at Turkey, if you look at Egypt, there is a synthesis between whole layers of people coming into struggle, experiencing the occupation of the squares, coming to grips with the idea of how to struggle for democracy, but also starting to tackle with arguments about the role of the agency of the working class, the traditional labour movements, and how do we start to bring these things together, I think it's very important to us. And we won't do it by counterposing our existing methods to the new methods that activists are starting to grapple with today.
Yeah, the internet is um, still in its pioneering stage, and uh, it's reminiscent of the uh, development of printing in the last century, because there are many celebratory cr uh, chronicles of technology and progress about uh, the internet, just as there were about the uh, you know popular press in, 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 in uh, the 19th century. Um, but some, I just wanted to go through a few statistics. Um, only th in 2011, about 30% of the total world's population were internet users. Um, only 15% of the world's population understand English, and 55% of websites are in English. 80% um, of internet news traffic goes to just 7% of sites, 67% uh, of which are controlled by the established media. Um, and only 14% of uh, news is independent, and even that is decreasing. Um, uh, most people, as Simon says, get their news from TV, not from the internet. Um, uh, in terms of uh, national inequalities, uh, most people that um, dominate the internet media uh, have greater time, knowledge, and written fluency. They're the people that dominate uh, uh, the internet just as they do uh, the traditional media. Uh, and they're, they're mainly white, affluent, affluent, educated males. Um, so uh, when we're talking about um, access and equality to the internet, um, that, that still is a, a huge problem. And it actually is growing worse, not getting better. Um, uh, so, I mean, while the internet has energized activism, and I think that's a really important thing, and it's connected people, um, you know, just the fact that there is low-cost internet does not mean that you get heard. Um, if you're right at the bottom of the search uh, websites, you will not get seen, you will not get heard. And, and that is important to remember that uh, the traditional media is dominating the internet just as it does, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, the newspapers, the TV, and all the other forms of media. Um, and a book I think that's really good, and what I got, I got a lot of information from, was called Misunderstanding the Internet. So I'm sure Bookmarks probably has it. It's a really excellent book. There's an old um, media studies concept about journalism, it's about gatekeepers, the idea of the journalist sort of sucks in loads of information and they filter it down and they decide what goes through. And it has limitations and it has advantages. But one of the things I've discovered in conversations with the way people talk about their use of Facebook is essentially as a gatekeeper. It saves me the time. My friends, right, both virtual and real friends, are doing a job of fil filtering for me all sorts of stuff. I never buy the Daily Mail, but every now and again something so bad is in the Daily Mail, I get to see it because I'm on Facebook because my friends have filtered it through. Or more generally, because the social network has filtered through and decided that these things are worthy of being shared and that's a form of organisation. Some people push that way too far and believe this is a new form that supplants all the other forms of organisation, think it's inferior, a waffle about horizontalism, clicktivism, and so on and so forth. But even at its lower level, it still has problems. Because one of them is, oh, well, that, that, that's so much better than the evil corporate media, and that's so much better than you outdated. Uh, I should confess, I'm the deputy editor of the legacy media that is socialist work. And um, what, what you see is outdated in those sort of things. But the, the simple way of looking at some of the downsides of that process, not in a moralistic way, but think about how do you work both in that level of filtering, who and how. The presumption that the crowd is right or accurate is, is a pretty high risk strategy. They simply, Lord McAlpine. There was severe child abuse on a systematic basis involving people involved in high positions in the state in North Wales children towns. Just because the media's been gone, making me very clear that Lord McAlpine wasn't part of that. Those two things, <coughs> you know, in that flurry, suggest to you that there were different ways in which this, it isn't automatic that what comes out of this process is a good one. However, in terms of an argument that says how we must use, yeah, we must use, the question is thinking about well, well let's think about how. And simply in terms of a number of documents that fall into traps. For instance, during the student movement, there was a great app. It was an app to help you crowdsource where the police were during the demonstrations. And what it was was, you know, essentially you could use the app to work out where the coppers were. 
It said it was a complete disaster because what it actually did was tell the coppers where all the demonstrators were. Yeah. Because what it said was, we're running down this street, now we're going to go down that street, and you announced you were to the internet. Because it didn't help the cops fire on the demo. It was completely counterproductive. A different way of using thinking about it is not through horizontal structures, but through actually the term, the old fashioned Leninist model. For instance, there's a thing called uh, Tomorrow's Papers Today, which is a hashtag. I'm by the, the editor of the World of One. Uh, it's for the chair, tell me, Charlotte. Well, not you. Um, but, <coughs> Actually, I was going to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people get in. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, I wasn't actually going to speak for this meeting at all, but I noticed when the hands went up, no women, their hands put up, and I think. That's probably an issue for a different meeting, but I think it's worth noting. Um, I've got up at meetings and talked about uh, what's gone on in, the, in the, our successful campaign in Manchester to save Levy um, Bars and Levy Library. And I wanted to talk about really, I don't think it's a, you know, internet bad, face-to-face uh, -face good. I don't think, you know, that polarisation is really quite a false thing. But I think what we've got to be honest about is how it really works. Now, we had um, an occupation of, of Levin June Bards, uh, sorry, Levin June Library. It followed a mass demonstration, a mass sit-in of the library, and people who wanted to stay and occupy stayed. The people who couldn't occupy for one reason, small children, etc., left. But there was a real big feel around the area that this was going on. Now, when we decided to leave, we put out tweets to on, we've got a thing called Levin Massive and stuff, come and join us, come and cheer us when we leave. So we left at one minute past midnight, because the police wanted us to leave before midnight, so we didn't. So we left at one minute before midnight, and one minute after midnight, and we got out, and there were, you know, there was 50 cheering people, which actually is no mean feat on a, on a, in a, of a Friday night, 11 June. Um, a couple of weeks later, a smaller group of us went and occupied uh, 11, 11 June baths. And we kind of thought the same process would go ahead, that we put a tweet out, and then we'd all be cheered when we came out again. Unfortunately, we didn't really talk to it about it to many people that we were going to do this and to watch out for it um, beforehand. So we left, and there wasn't anybody. And people's heads went down and thought, oh, we haven't got the support. Um, so it's no kind of substitute for talking to each other. The second thing is, again, on the Let the Bards campaign, we've had a huge argument on whether Labour should be uh, passing cuts budgets. Now, the argument has been on Facebook, and it's been in meetings. Now, if you go by the Facebook argument, it makes you feel really anxious and really nervous. But when we went and had the meeting with 100 people, at a public meeting, and we put the argument, I tell you what, 90% of the people there agreed. They weren't the people necessarily who were going to sit there and argue on the internet. Again, I'm not posing one thing against the other, but nothing is better than face-to-face -face communication at all. It can't be misinterpreted, you can have a two-way conversation, you can get people to Marxism, that's the only way to do it to be honest, more people sign up when you ask them face to face than any other way. So, you know, it's not one or the other, it's both in tandem, but one is more uh, successful in my opinion. Um, yeah, I'm looking at school. Well, I, I used to use the internet for relaxation, it doesn't seem to have been quite so relaxing recently, frankly. Um, I was really interested about what people said about the Egyptian Revolution because I think, unlike many other people, followed what was happening in Tahrir Square on Twitter. But what struck me, and it relates really to the Milgram experiment that Simon talked about, was how many people who were sitting in London obviously thought they were really in Tahrir Square. And I, I, actually I found that a little bit concerning actually. Because this idea that you sit and you are very atomised, that you are somehow participating in the same way by sitting at your computer screen on your own, is a bit of a problem, isn't it? And frankly, it sort of has resonances of what the Tories would like about postal ballots. Because you see, I got a postal ballot through my bloody door the other day for the GMB telling me to vote for a fucking 1% pay offer, which I'm pretty pissed off about. And we haven't had any union meetings about that because my rep said, actually, the union's already said it. 
They've said they had a bit of paper. They've said what they think. And surprise, surprise, we've got 90 bloody percent acceptance for a fucking 1% pay offer. Now that is atomization because I'll tell you what, if we'd all been in a room massively arguing it out and organizing, I do not think that vote would have been the same. Uh, just to finish off, you know, the Milgram experiment was about something very specific. It was about asking how can people behave the way they do when they are distanced from people. And I think some comrades in this room who are talking about open debate should think very, very carefully, actually, because when people try to debate on Facebook with people who just want to shut down and bully you, it is better to be in the same room, actually, where people do not say the same things face to face, but actually a whole load of men are bullying women who disagree with them and saying they are the majority when they are not. Uh, thanks, to, thanks to Simon for a very interesting uh, talk, actually. I mean, you kind of come away thinking, uh, I'm terrified of Facebook, I'm going to have to throw away my smartphone or something uh, uh, like that. But it was a really, really interesting uh, uh, at all, because I think that we do have to be clear about the limitations of social media online networks, particularly in the face of the kind of uh, cyber utopianism that is present in a lot of writing from the likes of anyone from Laurie Penny through to Clay Shirky or Joss Hands, or you know, people with some interesting things to say on one level or another, but really, which comes down to this idea that uh, social uh, media and the networks that they generate can become a replacement for real-world uh, organization, uh, old traditional forms of organization. I think we have to argue very much against that, pro uh, that, that uh, proposition. But I do also think that we need to look at uh, how uh, we have been able to use things like social media uh, to spread uh, uh, activity, spread organization, uh, particularly in areas where, uh, for example, the traditional networks of the left are weak and need to be strengthened. And I want to look at two particular cases where we've, um, where we've been able to see how that has happened in practice. I think the first uh, and most obvious one was the, the, what, what happened in the student movement um, at the end of 2010, after the, uh, uh, the uh, NUS abdicated its leadership um, of, the, of the student movement, after building an enormous demonstration which then spiralled out of their control and laid siege uh, to Millbank. Uh, the use of social media was actually very, very useful uh, in being able to spread information about the walkouts that were then planned, uh, to spread information into towns and, uh, and cities all around the country where the left didn't actually have any networks. Now, some people celebrate that in and of itself and say, that shows us that we don't need the old forms of organization. Actually, I think a better way of looking at that is how do you use that kind of penetration to rebuild traditional forms of organization? This can't be a priority uh, for revolutionaries, but I think that we uh, ignore it at our peril, and I think that some of the activity, as people have said, about the revolutionary socialists in Egypt, where they've been able to use those kinds of methods to establish contacts in different parts of the country, I think is a really uh, important uh, lesson. Of course, the other thing uh, that we saw was the way in which the workfare protests spread around the country, uh, very much fueled uh, in some way uh, by social media, although again, you don't want to go too far with saying that it was uh, some sort of autonomous uh, social media um, movement. What really kick-started it was the occupation of the Tesco's next to Parliament, but then that caught on in the media. And I think that one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that there is a relationship between uh, social media that's used by activists, traditional media, and organization. And part of the reason for that is uh, within traditional forms of media, the growth of of, of what Nick Davis describes as journalism, the recycling um, of, of press releases and that kind of thing has become more and more uh, important. But it's also meant that what happens on Twitter seems to have a disproportionate echo um, amongst the mainstream media. And so you see journalists relying on what they see uh, on Twitter. And it's for these kinds of reasons that I completely agree um, with the points that Simon uh, raises. But we also have to try and think creatively about how we can use social media to rebuild the kinds of organization that we need. Right, like a lot of people, I would. So, Egyptian Revolution is a very important reference point uh, for me in all this. I was a complete techno phobe, and I got convinced of the uses of Facebook in Alexandria, meeting 
young women comments, Mahia and all, uh, El Masri and her sisters, who told me that, that they had managed to organize the takedown of the state security for the torture center in Alexandria. We said, how on earth did you do that? Oh, through Facebook. Uh, they publicized the picket and so on, and all the secret police ran away. I mean, the secret police would have come out and arrested them and talked to them had not the secret police been defeated in the Battle of the Camel and the Egyptian Revolution as a whole. So that's the broader context. But within that, I thought we could do that. I think every organization, every branch can use Facebook and all the other media to publicize events and should do. We do it in Ireland. We've got a little thing like um, uh, Irish SWP Ireland TV, 10 minutes each week. Share it on Facebook, get it around, get it out there. Great. All that's good. Uh, I would say to people, and I think it needs to be in this context, to comrades actually, you have to understand that you put something on Facebook, this is a public statement. This goes potentially to the world, right? If you call a comrade a name and insult them, right, you might do it in the bar, right, and go three people here, and you do it on Facebook, it's heard in Cairo, literally. But you, and people need to, un to understand that. If we lived a bit under police repression, you'd get them arrested, right? But even in a situation where we don't live uh, under police repression, we're under ideological attack from the bourgeoisie, and they pick up on it. You know, it'll appear in The Guardian or, 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 or whatever. And even if you think you're joking, if, for example, you say that the current faction fight is fun, you wouldn't stand up with a meeting at Marxism and say that, would you? But you say it on Facebook and it goes to the world. People seem to forget in their own sitting in front of a computer that when you type in there, that is to all and sundry. Not directly, but somebody shares it, somebody shares it and it goes to the world. And really, therefore, I think in this sense that people have to remember, use social media in order to publicize things, but you are still a revolutionary, you are still a comrade, you speak for the movement, for the organization, and so on, to spread our ideas, don't use it for, you know, internal disputes and so on. Thanks. I'm really sorry that I couldn't get more in. Okay. I just wanted to quickly talk about some of the stuff we've done in Manchester. So, for instance, when we heard about the uprising in Bahrain, we wanted to do something. We found out that uh, representatives of the Bahrain royal family were doing a, a business event at a convention centre in Manchester. So, interestingly enough, about 10 of us turned up outside this convention centre with placards and, and flags and messages. And it was really interesting because actually over 20,000 people saw that on the internet. It was 10 people maximum and it took us about half an hour of action and it, it went viral and it was absolutely fantastic. So viral that the state television then had to uh, run a program about our demonstration because they were so shocked that people were demonstrating against their royal family and they had to actually sort of explain why we were there. And what was interesting is they used all sorts of lies like, oh well, um, some of them are drunken, uh, homeless people who have been paid to do that. I got accused of being paid by the Iranian government to be there. Um, don't know why they got that, something to do with the hijab, but anyway. But it was really interesting that the important point is that actually the two went together. We wouldn't have created that coverage on, the, on YouTube and on that then instigated the, the state media and the, and the authorities in Bahrain reacting if we hadn't actually been on the streets. So I think there's a two-way process. It's very important to understand that the two go together. One, we're not saying one you know, is more important than the other. The two can work together at the best of times. But I also just want to quickly touch on what happened in Pakistan. So for instance, we just had the elections in Pakistan a few months back, and it was amazing the coverage it got on YouTube and Twitter and the excitement that there was going to be this amazing victory for Imran Khan and there was going to be this revolution. You know, that it was a revolutionary moment. And people got really sucked into this. I remember, you know, I, I live along this area called the Royal Mile, um, not the Royal Mile, the, the, Royal, the, the, curry, the Royal Curry, and you basically they're all cafe shops and takeaways and all sorts of things. And you could go in after, after you know, nine, ten o'clock in the evening, and you'd have groups of people, especially young women from Pakistan, talking about the revolution that was taking place in Pakistan, you know, in Pakistan and what would happen. And it was really interesting, and I was having arguments with people, wouldn't it be great if Imran Khan got elected, because I don't think actually he could deliver all the stuff he's promising to deliver, and then there would be a real revolution. 
But actually, either way, we win. There's a revolution or whatever. But what was really interesting is when he didn't get elected and when the results were so poor, there was some real anger. People say, well, isn't it disgusting? Isn't it terrible? How did we get it wrong? I know. It was those poor people in the villages. They need to be educated. That's, it was their fault. And what really happened is that these activists in the big cities in Pakistan and places around, you know, places even in Manchester and globally, had got sucked into what they were seeing on the internet. And it was their world. It was what Asif was talking about. Simon Asif, sorry. It was what Simon was talking about, this idea that it becomes a bubble. You know, actually, rather than opening up the world, it closes you into what you think. And, and that's really what happened in Pakistan. So I think it really is a warning. There's nothing like going out and actually being in those villages, talking to those people. Uh, listen, thanks everyone for, uh, for, for, for contributing and thank you very much for agreeing with me. Of course, that's really, <laughs> that's really important. I, uh, one thing kind of came to, my, to, came to my mind, I think it's quite important that and I, I want to re-emphasize this, is I don't see it as being equal between what we do in the physical world and what we do in the... It, it, it's not an equal mix. What we do in the physical world is up there, and what we do in the internet social media is somewhere down there and I don't we shouldn't get that in mind that it's somehow equal or or we can do one or other or do a little mix we do and we work to it according to what we need because we use it for a, a bigger project which is actually overthrow of capitalism not creating alternative spaces etc et but actually physically having to overthrow capitalism so everything we I think we do and you do as a revolutionary obviously you know if you're just using social media to share recipes and so on it's not quite the same but, it, but, but as a revolution we have that in mind and every tactic we use we I think we have to be careful about I remember uh, Cliff uh, telling me uh, well telling uh, hearing the story told about how they used to distribute leaflets in Jerusalem uh, uh, under, under the rule of the British this was before this was uh, pre pre 48 and that was a fantastic method he said and you got a glass of water you printed the leaflets put them on a roof got a glass of water put it on top and because of the heat of the Middle East by the time midday came all the water had, you know evaporated the glass would fall and then in the evening of course being from the Levant, you have the beautiful breeze coming off the Mediterranean and so on, uh, and, it, and it blows the leaflets into the street. And you think, oh, absolutely fantastic. And then he said, whatever you do, don't try this in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, but really for me, and I think the point of the story wasn't so much the way he did this, but actually what was on the leaflets. What was on the leaflets was much more important because uh, 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 the difference between what he was putting out, what our comrades at that time were putting out, was the same message in Hebrew on one side and Arabic on the other. Because the Communist Party was saying one thing in Hebrew, one thing in Arabic. And so really, when we talk about the technique and so on, it's subjective to actually the politics. It's a politics that I think are really, really important. And I also think it, 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 it's something uh, 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 that, that, that was brought to me when I saw an interview with one of the key women in the April 6 movement in, in Cairo right after the revolution and they switched back on, remember they switched everything off during the revolution and it was a thing you know and even the Egyptian media was like oh the Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution and so on and they were interviewing her and it was the most uncomfortable interview I've ever seen because she, she was sitting in the studio and they were saying to her so tell us about how the internet you know spread the revolution and you see just, her face kind of went blank and she went and she was obviously searching for some kind of answer she said well, well what we did was we, we printed leaflets and we gave it to the lads in the street. Uh, we got the, uh, the, uh, someone who was friendly in the, in, the, in the mosque who had access to a printer, printed leaflets for us, and we gave it to the young lads to take round after prayers. And, into, and she was in person, you described, oh, this is a physical thing, you're building in your neighborhoods and so on. And they were like, no, 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 sister. We want to know what the internet did. And you can see her face kind of went blank again. She went, well, uh, then we, yes, we downloaded some information from the internet and then we printed it in this you know. and, and the thing is, I think it's really important that we understand that that physical element, I think is really, really important. And for me, I think that all the kind of, you know, the anger and the boo ha inside social media and so on was, was, for me, that moment of liberation was when I went to a, poll, uh, a bedroom tax meeting. Because I went to a bedroom tax meeting, we organized a little meeting in the estate, in the old method, knocking on doors and talking to neighbors and so on. And we got, I think it was about 30 people, mainly women, inside of the meeting. And something struck me. It wasn't simply even a question of Twitter and the internet. These people were living off sandwiches. That our people are in deep trouble. And you suddenly stop and you go, these people have no access to the internet. These are my neighbors. Actually, what I'm, what I'm discovering now about their lives, I can read in a hundred books, it doesn't quite hit you the way it hits you uh, inside. It's also much more useful. 
because from that meeting we discovered which doors not to knock on because they were not very nice people. And I think that's the other kind of element of it's kind of local knowledge. And I was always very fond of the kind of anti-capitalist slogan, think globally, act locally. Because what we have at the moment is kind of think globally, insult globally, be atomized, I think is rubbish. I think, I think we use this information in order for us to act where we are, where we are. And I think, uh, and, uh, and for me, and I will try and make this um, but, but, but the, the, the kind of my last point was I went into the Dole office the other day uh, because you know, the internet went down of course and so on and I was trying to look for jobs I thought oh, I'll just pop into the Dole office and because they've got it all on you know it's all internet and modern and everything and I, I saw a job and I picked it out and you had to apply for it online and I went to and I said you know, the problem is my internet is down oh and, and suddenly someone said but if you can't afford internet how, how are you supposed to get this job and they said, well, you know, you can go to the library. I said, well, we're lucky here because we've got a library, but they're closing all the bloody libraries down. So if you're unemployed, how do you get, you know, how do you actually go? This job I said, well, what you can do is you can book a place upstairs in, in the Dole Centre, and there's a slot. I said, when's the next slot? They said, next week. And, you know, and he was like, you know, and I'll tell you what came out, and I'll be rude, and I just remember thinking, fuck the internet. Fuck it, because actually what we're doing is, is that there is this real thing that's taking place in the world in which they're driving people into despair, and then we can pop out of it and simply pretend, you know, and live in this kind of bubble world. Let's break the bubble world. Actually, I was going to make my final, my, my final contribution is, for God's sake, get off Facebook. But I think I'll probably get, you know, booed off stage. But actually, get off Facebook, get into the street, because what we want to do is to smash the state, is to make a revolution. We use whatever we use, we use whatever we, we use, but we also, let's not get to cut with it, and this will be my final point, which is the story I wanted to tell, and I forgot to tell it earlier, which was the Hezbollah story. Because when we were a journalist in 2006 in Lebanon, there were a team of us, from, some from Reuters and the BBC and so on, we decided that you know, part of the thing about journalism, you have to prove what you say. Uh, and what we, wanted to try and, what we wanted to try and find out was, was there any real allegation to Hezbollah firing Katushka missiles from inside villages? And how do you do this? Well, we actually have to, so we split into groups and we went to physically see where they were firing their missiles from. And actually it turned out that you, it's really idiotic to fire that kind of missile from a village because he set fire to all the homes. So we were going, I remember was, uh, with Guy Smallman was also there taking pictures, you know, quite a stupid thing to do really, thinking back on it, of where the missiles were fired. And it was quite obviously the Israelis were lying. And here we could get from amongst this group of journalists a whole series of facts. It didn't happen to us, but one of the other teams then uh, told us when they got back a little incident that took place, which was as they were driving through this kind of empty kind of countryside of southern Lebanon, suddenly two lads on scooters appeared, stopped them. Uh, who are you? They said, oh, we're journalists from da 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 showed it. They, they, they took their information. So one of the lads went to the back of the scooter, opened you know, the little box, took out an office telephone, walked into the middle of the field, felt around, pulled out a wire, stuck it in, <laughs> and dialed through. And, and we were like, oh. They're not using the internet. Why are they using this system of wires between villages to villages? Because if the Israelis want to eavesdrop, they have to physically come and connect with the wires. And you think, at what point do we go up in technology, and at what point do we go down in technology? And I think sometimes you go down in technology because at least let's make them work for it. Yeah? Let's make them you know, drop soldiers behind enemy lines and hope that they get caught and, you know. Um, <laughs> have fed, let me nice, let me, you know, for fed, like, for fed nice, nice at least with that. But we, so let's not make any, uh, well, what, what I guess I'm saying is, none of these things are sacred. We use what we need to use for what we need to use. And if sometimes we use big social media, other times we go and we write with, you know, and we use the cheapest possible thing. This is much more important than any tweet from Tahrir. Because this calls for workers to come out on the 30th of June. What happened on the 30th of June was the biggest bloody demonstration in world history from old technology. So let's not make a, a big thing about technology, let's make a big thing about organisation and about meeting people and about being part of something much bigger and collective organisation. Thank you very much. For that.